Okay, I think we'll start with William's talk now. So William uh, is a um, long-term contributor. So actually I'll just make William a co-host so we can actually do presentations. There you go. And uh, so William's been a long-term contributor to RG Pilot um, and um, particularly in the area of sub and, and blue robotics, but he's also the developer and maintainer of the plot.rgpilot.org which is an absolutely fantastic plotting tool that is becoming more and more popular. And, uh, and also the, he was the one behind the user interface for our, uh, the, the, the new user interface for our terrain server. And so William, thank you so much for all your development done for RG Pilot over the years. And now over to you for your um, discussion of the um, Blue OS companion system. Okay. Thank you. So, hello, I'm William. Would you like to turn on for... video and, and screen share? Uh, yeah, just a sec. Not sure if video is going to work. That's it. Your video is working. There you go. Great. Let's see if screen and share works. Now. Yeah, that's tricky. Uh, I'm going to have to share the whole desktop. OK. Can you see it? Yep. That's great. Nice. Cool. So yeah, uh, I'm going to talk about BlueOS. It's the new companion system we are developing at Blue Robotics. So let's start at why we need it. So our old companion was forked and heavily modified our pilot companion. Uh, our pilot companion is a repository that's been like dead for at least two years. It was. I don't think there was actually anything original there from our pilot companion, but it was a fork. It was pretty hard to maintain, update, and integrate things into it. There were there was a lot of like monolithic pieces of code and things. So uh, sub relies heavily on companion computers. We need uh, an Ethernet connection for video streaming. Uh, it's also does the big sock flashing because it's usually inside an enclosure and so the big sock is hard to get to. It handles like joystick input and so and since the big sock is hard to get to, it's also responsible for fetching logs. And we also use a lot of different third party sensors, some that are not hard pilot specific like DVLs. Uh, under you just DVLs. started talking to me when I was in the kitchen. And, uh, I thought you were in the another, bathroom here. And get some extra audio from somebody. Yeah. Sure the mute. So we have lots of third party sensors that are integrated via the companion computer. And also integrators need an ecosystem where they can easily develop their own integrations to like in a maintainable way. Right now, people just fork our companion and it's pretty messy. There's no properly way of doing it. So what was our approach? We chose to go with cont containerized components and services. So we can like restart the update containers with a very low risk of needing to refresh the SD card in case something goes wrong. So it's very hard for something to go wrong that bad. So you need to refresh your companion SD card. Uh, this way, integrators can design their own systems in their own separate containers that runs uh, besides our container, our Docker container, yeah, instead of forking the whole system as it is today. And this way, dependencies are isolated, so individual services don't have to compete for uh, dependencies. We, we have a request for you to turn your mic up a little bit, if that's possible. Uh, yeah, let me check. We're having a hard time to hear you. OK. Uh, let me check if I'm using the right one. Yeah, it should be right. Oh, this is not right. Hello? Is, it, is this better? Hello? It's the same. That, that's pretty clear it's for me. It's the same for me. Yeah, I, not a big fan of Zoom, and this is one of the reasons. OK, uh, I'll just speak a bit louder. Is this good? Yes. OK, so we chose to go with a web interface and web APIs. 
So our car interface, it's like a consistent piece of code that is able to control and display all the active services on the system, including third party services. Uh, we have a section you'll see later that just uh, shows all the services and all the documentations found. We're working on having a dashboard on the main page so people can add widgets for third party services and our own widgets there for important pieces of information all in one place. Uh, our API structure allows services to communicate with, with each other. And we intend on building a web store so people can share extensions. So our integrators can design a piece of code for uh, maybe integrating a sensor or adding a new functionality and publish this in, this in our store. So for the front end, we decided to go with uh, Vue.js and TypeScript. It allows for really very reactive components. See the heartbeat icons in a sec. Uh, we use Vuetify to make it go look good. And it relies heavily on Mavlink to REST, REST Mavlink that was uh, made by Patrick for integrating Mavlink to the front end. So we can have lots of Mavlink information on the front end. Our back end is using Python 3.9, which should be great for be great to 3.10 soon. REST is used for developing some of their critical systems. And we use Mavlink Rotor for the Mavlink routing. <laughs> but we also support Mav, uh, Mav proxy backend. So uh, let's get started. To, to the left, it's the main main interface you'll see when you open the Blue S. At the top right, we have uh, lots of little. Okay. <laughs> uh, this is a GIF, so it's a bit hard to follow. Let's follow the GIF. Let's wait a bit. Now we start over. So, uh, okay. There we have lots of small pieces of information for the like, stability of the system, uh, temperature, voltage, uh, Wi-Fi controls, uh, internet wiring controls. Uh, we have also the notification system. We have lots of Wi-Fi information there. We can. Uh, control wired interface set static dynamic IP addresses. We can now force fetching, uh, getting a new DHCP lease. This is the main menu. Uh, we can power off, reboot, restart only the container if you want. As a settings, uh, we have this pirat mode, which enables uh, advanced functionality for advanced users. So like our basic user uh, should be fine without pirate mode just for piloting the ROV, and developers will likely want to enable this. Uh, we also have this uh, at the bottom right. We have lots of warnings when things go wrong, like high disk usage, high CPU temperature, when we lose Mavlink heartbeats for some reason, like the autopilot died or something. So this is a, an overview. These are all the features we have right now. Uh, I'll go through each of them in the next slides. The autopilot section, we can like change, we can change boards if you have multiple boards connected. This is a very developer folks feature. We can, if you have multiple boards, you can switch between them or even enable zero. We can uh, fetch, fetch a repository from the manifest and our pilot servers. You can upload the custom firmware file, or you can restore the default file that we have embedded in the Blue S itself for when people have no internet, which is often the case for aerobis as people are in the middle of the ocean. Oh, this did not work as expected. Okay, uh, the log browser shows all the logs from the autopilot. It's able to replay the files in log viewer. It's, 
it works completely offline as well. So it's embedded in BlueIS itself. You can also delete, delete logs, download them to your computer. And we are working on downloading logs from a pixel could be a MAV FTP, so, but that's not right yet. Next section, MavLink endpoints. So here you can create custom MavLink endpoints. So you can connect additional GCSs, components, or scripts. You can individually uh, enable or disable each endpoint. And it's analogous to MavBricks, MavProxies dash dash out, where you can send strings to different places. And as the other services, it, this also has an API for easier integration. Next, video streams. So this was mainly developed by Patrick as well. This is a Rust service that detects uh, USB cameras capable of streaming. Right now it's only H.264, but we are working on it. This also exposes the VFRL configurations, as you see now, all the brightness, contrast, filters, everything from the camera. This this string can be either UDP or RTSP. And for developers, we also have a fake source option that just generates a fake stream in the in BlueIS itself. This is the, the famous GStreamer video test source where you have like a ball going around the screen. We just finished integrating WebRTC that we, because we intend on adding GCS capabilities to this with video stream. Okay, next, next session, available services. Oh, these GIFs are not helping. So we have a session that shows all the available services. This is it. Here you have uh, the address, the, the documentation address, and if the documentation is, the API is versioned, you have the version of link. We are using Swagger UI to show all the open API options. And you can actually test all the endpoints here. This is the result for this endpoint. So the idea is to be very developer friendly so people can develop <laughs> happily. And this is a, like the unified place to looking at our APIs and what's going on. Next. Okay, uh, so this is our, these are all the services we have right now. Our pilot manager is the backend responsible for uh, managing the Mavlink streams. And if I'm not mistaken, doing the firmware updates. Beacon is a new service. It, it's been developed it for MDNS uh, publishing, so we can actually do blueos.wifi.local, etc. Uh, we had to develop it because Avahi was just not doing the job properly. This is the front end. Bridget is the one responsible for uh, doing serial to UDP bridges, so we can connect serial sensors to UDP streams. Cable guy is responsible for our cabled Ethernet management. Commander is, is a service that uh, is able to run commands in the host system. So if you need to escape the Docker for some reason, you have to talk to Commander. File browser is our file browser. Camera manager we already talked about. We also have Mavlink to REST running that also has uh, a nice Swagger API running, Swagger UI. Uh, we have an NMEA injector that's used by, well, I'll get there. It's used by Stern GPSs. Pardal is the guy that does network speed tests. We have a guy that shows system information, a web terminal, version chooser for uh, showing versions themselves. This is an experimental service. Waterlink DVL is an experimental third party integration that I've been working on for integrating a DVL. And lately we have the Wi-Fi manager that is the backend for managing all the Wi-Fi connections. Okay, next. So bridges. This guy 
as I mentioned before, is, is able to bridge serial ports to UDP ports. Uh, think of it as sockets from Linux. This is already used under the hood to power our sonars. So both our Ping1D and Ping360 uh, are using it. Ping1D is a regular sonar, just a finger that measure, measures distance. And Ping360 is a scanning sonar. So it does a full 360 sweep. Both of them are connected via USB and have a new DP port assigned to them so that we can talk via our, our Ping viewer, that's our interface for VM sonars. But this should work with any serial port as long as you have on the other side something that can talk to UDP. This is also made in Rust, by the way, and by Patrick. Okay, uh, we have a file browser. It makes editing files a lot easier. You can look at all your config files, you can change files. If you want, you can, like, if you want to tweak a service to test something, you can do it here. These changes are not permanent because it's uh, running in a Docker container. So, with, so you would have to do a Docker commit in order to save it. And this is, yeah, very useful for development. You can, for example, when running Arduino Linux, you can delete you can reset the storage file and do some weirder things. Not that I recommend it, but yeah, it's useful. Okay, the NMEA injector, we have this guy for uh, taking NMEA strings via UDP and then converting them to GPS input MavLink message to send to autopilot. This is the way some uh, underwater GPS integrations work like uh, the water link at underwater GPS, I think Cerulean as well. This is like a generic approach for implementing this GPS functionality on Aerovis because water doesn't allow GPS signals to go very deep. So, just um, sorry, it's Randy here. Uh, one one problem though, I thought with the Namia method. Uh, or sorry, the Nemea GPS is they don't provide velocity. I wonder if those um, underwater yeah, GPSs yeah. can provide velocity and if we're throwing some data away. Uh, in my experience, the underwater GPSs are not very accurate at all. So I don't think that even makes much sense. Uh, I don't think they can. I haven't checked properly. So for velocities, people usually use DVLs, which are Doppler velocity loggers. Any other question? Sorry, actually, I have just a random question. So you, you just mentioned uh, what DBL or something? Is that is that like DBL? It's a Doppler velocity logger. It's a it's a sonar that has usually a three or four, I think, trans, transducers, and it checks the difference in frequency, like the Doppler, Doppler shift from the reflected signal when a vehicle is moving. So it can very accurately measure velocity in water, as long as the seafloor is in the range. Right, right. And I guess, well, I guess I can ask you offline. I've, I've never, never actually heard of that before, but it sounds a bit yeah, like low for, for submarines or something. But I guess yeah. it only, it only works in the direction, like optical flow works horizontally, you know, assuming that the camera's facing down. It's like, um, I guess this would work only when you're facing the thing. So it could tell like how quickly you're moving up and down if it's facing down, is that the idea? Yeah, we can talk after, after the presentation, yeah. but it's usually facing down. So you are, you are able to hold position in X, Y, Z. Really? As long as the ground is there. But I can, I can show you some videos after this presentation. Yeah, the, the DVL integration that I have in development is not uh, using GPS messages. It's using the visual odometer message. So it works. It doesn't have an absolute position because it only measures velocity. So it's a bit different. Okay, I think I'll go on. So we have a whole section for 
system monitoring. Uh, it shows all your processes, uh, all the information in DMASC is there. So all the kernel messages, uh, some general about version as well. We have all the processes. It's very similar to HTOP. So you can see here that I'm running Arduino Pilot on Linux. Some overview, some overview of networking as well. And that's it. This is just for system monitoring and debugging as well. Oh yeah, I forgot I had it <laughs> larger. Yeah, I think I'll just go on. Okay. Okay, we had a network speed latency test because for uh, ROVs and other vehicles that use IP connection, the bandwidth is, especially if you have video, the bandwidth is critical. This is also used for troubleshooting in, for, in ROVs, for troubleshooting tether issues, connection issues. It's, it measures your upload, download, and at the bottom, you have the latency in the video clock. That's the latency before, be, between your browser and your companion computer. We'll probably make one of these for internet as well. We also have a terminal. We have a terminal in the web itself, in the web UI. Uh, this has Tmux, it's a Tmux session by default. You are, you, you are able to exit the Tmux session to get into the, I mean, you are able to escape the container and get into the Pi itself if you wanna make permanent changes or something like that. And uh, here you can find all of our services and how you can queue any of them, restart any of them in a very easy way. But yeah, with great power, you can break things. But that's why this is only also only on, available in pirate mode. <laughs> so we also have a Mavlink inspector. Uh, you can look at all your Mavlink messages. Uh, we have some special handlers for some of them. So they, we have some more of a human readable output. At the right, you can have all the raw data. This is similar to probably other Mavlink inspectors you've seen before, like Mavproxy Watch or the Mavlink inspector in QGC. We should, we'll probably get some live plotting going on eventually, but it's a work in progress. And this is kind of a critical section. This is the update system. Uh, it's also, it's completely based on Docker. Uh, it has two uh, interfaces. There's a simple interface when you don't have pirate mode act that is very simple to use. When you open BlueOS for the first time, it will check if there's a new version available. It will show you this message. Anytime now, this. This takes you to version chooser and you can just click update there. And that's it. And then we have the more advanced version. As soon as the GIF restarts. But this uh, is for advanced users. You can switch to any version. You can switch to your own Docker Hub remote if you want. You can upload Docker image files manually. And yeah, we have to wait a bit now. So if uh, an integrator wants to do some changes and he really doesn't want to use our car, you can just switch the remote versions down there and it will just start using their, own, their remote and that's it. There's no, there are no complications. 
So here uh, I'm switching from 1.0 at robotics to my own. So I just I just write my remote here. <laughs> it finds the messages and I can download and apply it. And that's it. After this is done, uh, there's a new image and I'm running the new image. And this will, this will only, even if the process fails right now, it's only pulling the image. So there's no way it can be broken because the image is only saved after it finishes downloading. And we also have some other uh, contingencies in place. For example, if you, if someone builds an image that doesn't have the, this interface for changing versions working properly, we have a guy that's just checking every, like every, I don't remember the time, but it's periodically checking if this interface works. And if it doesn't work, it reverts to a factory image. That's, that's not work. And we also have some other planet features that didn't, we haven't finished yet. We are planning, we have actually already a pull request, like a work in progress for parameter configuration. On top of that, we want to make customizable, customizable, customizable vehicle setup for individual peripherals. So for, for sub, we want to have individual tabs for, let's say, gripper, uh, camera setup, lights, and now each, even DVLs and other stuff, we want to have individual tabs to control each of them in a very user intuitive way. We are working on an onboard vehicle con control software, GCS, that's web-based, including video, joystick support. And we, we want to build a widget-based display. So we want to allow third-party integrations to build widgets and overlay that on top of the video. So they can basically do whatever they want. We are also working on having onboard video audio recording because right now it's done on the top side as our, with our current uh, solution. And doing it on board will also allow you to have more cameras in there. Uh, okay, custom extensions and the, the store, as I mentioned before. Another big thing that we are uh, working on is multi-source login synchronization. So we'll have multiple video streams. We'll have data flash logs, uh, telemetry logs, uh, logs from sonars and other sensors from users. And we want to be able to centralize this somehow and replay this out synchronized the video the replay data, the sonar data, everything. This is a, it's a, it's a big deal, <laughs> uh, especially for people doing uh, inspections and similar things. We also wanna get some debugging tools in there, like a GDB server for when you're running uh, Arduino sub on Linux, maybe open this OCD for other boards. We want to support multiple boards. Uh, right now, we support some Raspberry Pis. Our software is pretty agnostic, but we have some limitations yet. And also, web map link console, so you can just send whatever you want to, to your vehicle. So this is our uh, built-in GCS prototype. It's running on a phone with a Bluetooth joystick and connected to a uh, five gigahertz Wi-Fi. I also have a video to show. So let me find this here. This is a video of the, the same day. This was recorded on my phone. This is just a very crude prototype, but we have uh, Mavlink data. We have joystick control. We have a fish. I'm pursuing <laughs> more like stalking. And 
I think that's it. I'll just keep this video playing for now. Any questions? It reminds me of playing Doom or Quake. You know, the thing is the arm out the front and wandering around. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't tried uh, Chainsaw yet. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, that's yeah. that's really really brilliant. Uh, thank you so much for the. I'll just turn on video there. Oh, that's, uh, I think actually there's one last slide. I think. Ha. Uh -huh. So you can you can try it. Uh, we have a download link that will be in the slide. I'll share as PDF. But if you go to this repository, you should be able to find find something. The the images uh, are available as a GitHub release, so you can just uh, download the image and flash it to a Raspberry Pi. Another thing to note is that we are focusing this right now on Sub and Rover, but we would love to support other vehicles as well. But that's absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for that, William. And um, customizing it, I mean, um, is it possible to skin it so to be suitable for different uh, different vehicle types and different vendors? So like a, a partner might want to make a version that's suitable for their vehicle and they might want to use a different theme instead of sort of the, the pirate theme that goes so well with, um, you know, nautical um, applications. You know, they might want to have a, a different theme to that. How, how would they go about theming it and uh, skinning it for their particular use case? Yeah, this is not ready yet, but it's a planned feature. Uh, I forgot to add it there. But we are adding, we are thinking at exactly that. So Blue Robotics builds a lot of components, actually. We have lots of companies that use our components to make different ROVs. And we already thought that they would, someone would want to customize it. So that's already planned, at least colors and a logo. And would Blue Robotics do consulting for, for partners who want, um, you know, customizations and, and, you know, adding features and things? Is that something that is within what Blue Robotics could do? Uh, it hasn't been discussed yet, but I think so. We can talk after this. Hmm. I, I, I could imagine that some partners might find this, you know, really quite a compelling capability. Um, uh, but they'd they'd want to you know customize it and have um, particularly their own sort of imagery and branding and things on it, um, yeah. and uh, and adjust the features to be suitable for their vehicle. Hmm. So open the floor now to questions from anyone. So uh, questions and comments, uh, very welcome from uh, anyone in the audience. Yeah, quick question here. How long till we can fly a plane with it? Well, we haven't tried. <laughs> I don't have any planes right now, but <laughs> I think it should work. If we send you a Bixler, will it happen? Maybe. <laughs> I'm open to trying it. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't flown planes for a while now. I mean, the good thing about ROVs is that they never fall out of the sky. <laughs> that that can get uh, wrapped yeah. around walls, though. Uh, that sounds like a challenge to me. Can you send one over? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have a question, actually. Um, I think you were mentioning that you were going to work on um, you know, uploading files to the cloud, like onboard logs or something. Was that, did I hear that correctly? Uh, not in this presentation, but we are working on, we have to work on downloading logs from the Pixel via Mav FTP, but probably later on, we will develop a whole uh, cloud side from, from this for uploading logs and log analysis, especially after the log synchronization thing is done, we'll probably have a cloud backend for storing and replaying it. Since you yeah, say, imagine... oh, sorry, Randy, go on. Yeah, no, I can just imagine that, you know, um, a bit like boats, you know, obviously I do a lot of boats and um, uh, and one of the issues is that you build up a lot of uh, data on the log, you know, on, on the companion computer um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's a mess to 
to, to get it off of there, unless you've got some service like what you've got here. So it sort of, sort of fits in well, I think. Um, so I can imagine, yeah, you're thinking about that. Yes. But I, I don't think you'd want to download the logs via Mav FTP. I think it'd be better to stream the logs live um, using the, the Mavlink support for streaming our logs to the companion computer and that way, and then upload them from the companion to the cloud. Uh, otherwise, it, it can take quite a long time to download that um, from the flight controller to the companion. You don't want to have to sort of sit the vehicle and leave it alone for a while to, to do that. It'd be much better if the log was already there by the time you finished your mission. Yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, mm. I'm not sure if that was broken in Mavlink Rotor, but yeah, we have to get back to that. I know Peter's been doing a bit of work on that lately. Um, and there are, there are a few partners who are using that, um, the streaming of the logs directly to a companion. Um, but, it, but that would be a, an important feature in, in something like this, I think, so that you know, all of the logs get automatically archived um, onto a cloud server without the user having to, to do anything. Um, yeah, and I'm, that it, I'm, yeah. I'm, I am keeping an eye on uh, AP Clouds as well. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Uh, yep. Uh, Arpanion and AP Cloud have recently integrated. Uh, so that's Steve and myself got together and made sure it worked. So, cool. you know, it's, um, that's nice. it's going in the right direction. Awesome. Yeah, it's going to take uh, probably a few months before we start working on any cloud thing, <laughs> but we should stay in touch. Um, yeah, I was wondering about like where you're drawing the lines uh, on the application. You know, um, like um, like I noticed there's there's a bunch of different different things that it does. For example, like you can do the companion computer setup and the you know um, you know setup of services and restarting services and all that that kind of stuff. And then um, and then it also, but it also at the same time does, for example, like um, like. Um, of course, of the firmware upgrade, that's that's obviously uh, really really important. But then it actually starts moving into kind of you know ground station uh, features as well when you start doing like the log browsing on board and, and that kind of thing. And I was just wondering, you know, why you decided to to go so far. I mean, there's obviously you know you know more is usually better, but you know at some point as well, it um, yeah. you know you wonder why you use that instead of like an existing ground station which has some of that stuff already built in. So yeah, we are not we usually use qgc but we're not very happy with it and maintaining it and uh at one point we just decided to do our own things and this way we decrease the amount of software in our ecosystem because we have only blue s and our, our pilot so we don't have now a, a companion a gcs and a flight uh so, controller. We don't have the flight controller and everything now is part of Blue S and it's completely under our, our control. So it's a lot, of, a lot easier for us to keep track of. Yeah. Uh, yeah. M making everything a work, work delivered certainly has its benefits. Yeah. A lot of our work in QGC has been just maintenance and keeping things working. So it's a bit exhausting. Yes. You want to have a very specific um you know solution for for your site yes. um, yeah it's a very it's kind of a very specific use case so we had lots of uh very sub specific things in qgc as well we also have some things in there that also were not uh, done properly so we want to do it properly this time cool and actually have a, just a follow-up question you know one of the um things that uh well, sorry, I guess, you know, integrating with um, a sonar um, is something that I'm also interested in. Uh, so for example, you know, you have like a flight controller it's producing um, you know, its attitude and position, all that kind of stuff. And you want to get that data somehow integrated in with a side scan sonar or, or a regular sonar. You know, right, right now, um, you know, we, you know, the only integrate way that we can integrate those two, from my, as far as I know, is to, you know, actually connect the sonar to the flight controller. And, and that's what I normally do. But then you know there's this bandwidth limitations. There's only so much data that you can you know squeeze into a flight controller or send into a flight controller and have appear in the onboard logs. You know, so um, you know the obvious solution I thought was to, to put that on the companion computer. And I'm just wondering, is that something that you're planning or or is it already yeah, done? I maybe think that, 
I think this is in the log synchronization thing uh, I talked about. For some sonars, so let's say a side scan sonar that's a lot of data in there, we really can't store that in the in the autopilot, uh, like in the data flash. There's no chance. So we want to work on a solution that uh, synchronizes all all these log files and allows for for third party uh, sensors. I'm getting some weird noises in here. Let's see if it was the video. But yeah, we want to work on a solution that integrates everything. And I'm not sure if this was your question, but for sending things to the autopilot, in our current companion, we have a man in the middle that works between our ping viewer and companion. I mean, between ping viewer and the sonar that turns the data into Mavlink and feeds it to the autopilot. But that's only for the depths. Yeah, yeah, so you're I'm saying not sure yeah, if I yeah. answered your yeah, you know that that is that's a great answer. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I can sort of see that you're you're hitting the same issues that I've been hitting on both sides, which is that you have this ton of data coming in, you can't put it in the autopilot. You still want to make it visible to the pilot, though. So you need to get some like cut down version of that of that data, you know, sent through the flight controller and then you know sent up to the, the pilot wherever they are. Um, yeah, we have to send to the autopilot only exactly what it needs. So like we can we can't have it processing everything. Or yeah. Our ping one D, it's while we only consume the depth, it produces a, an array of data with like, yeah. Data get a backscatter data, data, right? Yes. You get a ton of uh, uh, you know, you don't just get a single distance like a lidar. You get like a whole bunch of distances, and 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 it's not really very convenient to handle that inside of RGPA. Yes. One thing I want to try is I, I want to get our scanning sonar. That's uh, three sixty in a plane and I want to generate a uh, obstacle obstacle messages for I want to I want to see how that goes yeah either so you can get some avoidance sensor. going yeah, proximity sensor great question uh, yeah. question uh, I missed it what kind of hardware is the companion running on is it a Jetson or and how is it connected to the RG pilot uh, it's running on a Pi 4 right now. Uh, it works both connecting via USB on a, to a big SALC or any flight controller, or uh, it can run uh, our pilot Linux. We have we are working on a board that it's a Linux board, so it can just plug on top of the Pi. So we have the, both the flight controller and the companion at the same package. So one of my other thoughts with regards to how this sort of applies to other vehicles is that you need a high speed IP link to the vehicle in order for it to be useful. Rovers don't have that problem because they've got an ethernet cable um, and you've got, you know, 100 meg or gigabit ethernet um, and, you know, doing similar on a plane, you don't necessarily have that sort of link. Yes. Uh How is that done now? Uh, these days, if you want a high-speed video link, uh, you'd use something like a here link or a, a Chinese clone of it, um, and you'd, you'd get your video that way. Uh, no, I, I'm wondering about companions. Uh, the way I see it, you could uh, set it up on the ground and then just fly. Uh, we are working there... on, on it having a hotspot, so you could connect to yeah. the hotspot while on the ground yeah, but, and then but... just fly. That's right. For for aircraft and, and it, a companion is usually more useful for configuration than it is for you know, fly, flying it through a web browser. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you could. Uh, yes. Oh, of course. The by the way, the GCS, this GCS we're working on is going to be a different uh, system. So it's going to be one of those extensions we talked about. So it's not really required. We'll probably have a different one for Rover, and maybe that one will be more uh, plane friendly <laughs> for waypoints and navigation. 
Yeah, I think for planes, there is a lot for planes and uh, multi rotors and other flying things. There is a lot of data radios that you can get. You'll you definitely run into lower data rates, and certainly as you get to distances, you're running right. into like yeah, you know, maybe five megabits or, per second or something like that. But it's enough to stream a, a good compressed HD video stream. Yeah, there's um, quite a few different I did radios also have one, uh, available now. Yeah, you can yeah. put some Ethernet directly through the Helink as well. Um, if you need a, an Ethernet link, um, obviously the rate depends on distance, etc. Yes, but that's probably one of the few ones on the market that actually can do those sorts of bandwidths right now. Well, there's, there's Doodle Labs and there's the Syllabus and things. So there's, there's all different price points with different capabilities, uh, you know, uh, for ones. But um, the Helinks obviously are, you know, really well integrated choice. Yeah, and, uh, well, and I had uh, one question about the um, kind of like the, the multi-logging streaming kind of system to, as uh, Trish was asking before about integrating data from multiple sensors. Um, yeah, it's definitely a problem that that's come up a lot and, and um, yeah, there isn't, there isn't a one size fits all solution really. I was wondering if you would, if there's any option or if there's any, any kind of way to also maybe tie in with the video data as well. It doesn't come up a lot, but sometimes there's really good, there's something really good in that FPV video footage, or maybe even in, in rare circumstances, some kind of outside video footage that's recorded. Yeah, for ROVs, that comes up a lot. Uh, yeah, that's, that's one of our main goals to synchronize data logs and sensor logs with the video. So people can, that's, that, was, that has been asked a lot. Uh, we're oh, yeah. yeah. Want to ask one thing uh, regarding this H.264 video transmit link? Uh, we are doing something very similar over the VPN, but what I faced is this: over the VPN, the H.264 have some issue with the LTE parameter of the VPN, like uh, the image is uh, graying out a lot compared to a normal image. Have you seen this kind of thing transmitting H.264 over the Ethernet? Uh, I have seen this on QGC when you lose packages, uh, depending on the camera, it kind of goes to a gray or silver image. Yes. Uh, with, I haven't experienced this with WebRTC and uh, you can see in this video, there are no, uh, yes. Yeah, images. I can see that. Yep. Uh, yes, uh, there's uh, actually. Was this on QGC or what was? Uh, no, uh, we were using the mission planner uh, actually. Okay. Uh, and uh, even I've seen this thing over the Doodle Labs radio. When you run a, a mapping router over the, <coughs> I'm sorry, when you send the H.264 first image over the Doodle Labs radio, I've seen similar but in a much worse scenario. I dig deep into it and what I figured out is the parameter for MTU. You have to uh, tune MTU to some value. Um, I'm not sure how to tune that. My actually question was if you know how to tune it properly. That was all. Yeah, sorry, I'm not aware of that. I guess that's thanks. No problem. Yeah, so MTU is your maximum transmit unit. Um, and it's common that the different transports, if you've got a whole bunch of different transports, you've got Wi-Fi and Ethernet and various other transports, VPNs, et cetera, between the, uh, the origin of the data and the endpoint, you often want to uh, you know, tweak down your, your MTU so that you don't get fragmentation of packets. Um, and because the packet fragmentation can lead to less reliability. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's quite common to have to tweak MTU. If you just search for, you know, MTU adjustment on VPNs, there's quite a bit of information out there. Yep, yep. thanks for that. So, William, multi-vehicle support, um, that's something that's come up a lot with controlling, you know, particularly multi-rotors and planes uh, lately. Is that something you've dealt with at all with submarines? Have you thought about, you know, one operator controlling multiple vehicles? And would that just be opening multiple tabs in your browser? Or is there more integration for multiple vehicles in the in the control? I think for ROVs, it's most common to have more than one pilot per vehicle, but this would probably belong to the cloud solution. Right, so you're thinking more um, like the, the AP cloud stuff that's being done by uh, 
by Hefni and by Buzz, and that that's more the solution you think? Uh, kind of. Uh, we we are planning on expanding this to cloud to the cloud eventually, and then I think only then we'll be able to actually support multiple vehicles vehicles properly. But uh, mm -hmm. right now, if you have multiple vehicles and you open your tabs, you can control both uh, with little issue. I mean, we don't have a way to select the joystick right now. But it's not very, it's not a common, that common in the ROV world. Mm -hmm. I, I guess you'd need to set up the ports because you've got the one ground station multiple tabs, the like the UDP port uh, numbers and things you'd have to separate out so that it can. Maybe, I mean, not, probably not. Uh, the other web part is uh, client and the ROV is mostly the server. So you just connect to two servers. Right, okay. Yep. And the WebRTC, the video is WebRTC, so that sorts itself out. For, and the joystick is WebSocket, that also shouldn't be an issue. It's a URL instead of a part. So is the resolution of the video that's being displayed um, on the, the user interface, is that the same resolution that is actually being captured on the camera or, or do you then record high resolution video on the vehicle for, uh, for you know, when you want to publish it later? Right now we do transmit at the same resolution that we will record, but we are planning on do transmitting a lower resolution later on when they get uh, hopefully a 4K camera. This is a full HD, full HD camera. Mm -hmm. So it's fine to transmit, but we want to get a 4K and it, we're working on it. So we, then we'll probably need to string at a lower resolution. Right. I was also uh, thinking yeah, about there, if you had there, outages. There was, <laughs> but to be honest, the power resolution in the, the camera resolution in this video is from my phone. I just recorded it on the phone because we don't have a, we don't have a recording solution yet. And if you had multiple cameras on the vehicle, will it sort of be able to select between different cameras on the vehicle? I'm, I'm guessing it'd be fairly e common in a Rolf to have a like forward facing e and backward facing and yes. other cameras. This is another request that we got often. So Mavlink Camera Manager already has support for multiple cameras. Mm -hmm. In QGC, you can already switch between cameras using the joystick. So that's mm -hmm. all, all in place. But as this is just a prototype of the web GCS, we don't have anything like that yet. I mean, it's probably most of a UI thing. The, the backend will probably help handle everything fine. Do people do stabilized cameras on, on ROVs or are they, they always just sort of fixed orientation? Like uh, they, do, they do stabilized cameras. Uh, one issue we have with gimbals is that we don't have a lot of space inside the ROV. Let me show you. Oh, this is a heavy eye. Can you see this? Mm -hmm. So the camera is inside this enclosure. So there's not, not a lot of room for like a brushless gimbal. Right now we only stabilize pitch. But I have been experimenting with a brushless gimbal, but I haven't got anything good yet. So you mostly would do the stabilization in post-processing if you want to publish a video, I guess? Uh, I, I'm not sure it comes to that. I think they're not, the videos are usually not that bad. I mean, in this one, I don't think I had any stabilization on, did I? Yeah, just a bit. But I'm not, I'm not actually sure. Certainly for uh, on copters and on, on planes, sort of controlling of gimbals and things would be would be quite important. So, you know, perhaps that would make sense as a plug-in um, yeah. to be able to control the, you know, the gimbal pointing uh, and the stabilization. Is that usually done with points of interest or just manual control? Uh, depends on the application. Uh, depends whether you're sort of surveying and you know you've got somebody actively looking at it, or, or whether you've got like a, you know, a flight plan where you want to look at some particular points. Um, so, uh, 
know, both are, are available and you might have a button to switch between the different modes. Yeah, what we usually use in the review world is that we have buttons. Uh, we use a regular like PS4 or Xbox joystick and we have buttons that tilt the camera up or down. Mm -hmm. Because right now you can only control it up or down, so it's not a big deal. And I guess that roll and the L are mostly just stabilized anyway in most vehicles. Great. All right. Yeah. Well, that's been absolutely fantastic, William. Any, any more questions before we uh, we finish up? Oh, on yeah. That one? Yeah. I just wanted to, um, you know, kind of clarify something a little bit. And I guess you know we're gonna have we're gonna have some more discussions about the cloud in in, uh, in later presentations from uh, you know Buzz and, and others. But um, I guess one thing to sort of um, keep clear in, in in your mind is you know especially like with this application, it covers like a lot of ground. Um, and and there's like the web ground station part, but then there's also like the whole companion computer setup, you know, service management and, you know, configuration part. They're like two, in my mind, at least, they're two very separate things. And the, um, the, the companion computer management part, I think is actually the more like portable part. Like that's like kind of a general uh, service that is really useful, I think, for uh, like a wide variety of people. I think once you get into the, um, the web, ground station part, it becomes much more application specific. And that's where we start, yes. you know, running into these questions about, you know, does it have multiple cameras, multiple vehicles, you know, does it, you know, do log analysis and all this kind of stuff. And that, that's like a whole different can of worms. It's like a massive problem. And I think that one's really hard to, um, it's much harder to move across um, applications. Yes. So I guess if I, I had any requests, it's sort of, you know, when you're developing this, if you can try and keep those separated because so that we can use one part without the other part, you know, that's assuming that's all open source, I think it is, right? Yeah, that's our goal, actually. Uh, the WebGCS will be one of those extensions we, we talked about and on our on its separate container and everything, so you can just not use it. Cool, great stuff, really impressive. Yeah, it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna be, yeah, it's gonna be self-contained. So we can actually use different uh, control software for rovers or ROVs, because I know rovers usually don't do video, so we'll probably need a map instead. We'll, we're also thinking about how to handle uh, multiple networks for rover, for uh, 4G and maybe some satellite links for MapLink only. Cool. All right, any final questions? Well, thank you very much, William. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, looking thank forward you. to this being deployed widely and uh, hopefully applied to other vehicle types as well. Um, but yeah, let's, let's like a, get a really compelling rest. system and uh, greatly appreciate your talk. So uh, thank you. Thank you very, very much.